All right. Um, hi, everyone. Great to see so many of you still here after a long Whoa. day. I guess that can mean a couple of things. Um, either you dozed off, uh, you're really curious about international peace and security and cyberspace and what you can do to contribute, or you think this is about hacking into the UN. Uh, if you think it's the latter, it's not. Well, at least not really, unless you, unless you count social engineering, which I'm sure we'll get to as well. So this is really about how we as a community can better contribute to these war and peace discussions taking place in places like the United Nations, but also between multi-stakeholder organizations, civil society, and private companies, and uh, what DEF CON can do. So my name is Alexander Klimberg. I'm a policy wonk and a writer, and uh, I have done the cyber policy under different hats, uh, mostly in think tanks and universities, places like CSIS, Atlantic Council, and Harvard University. Uh, and I've written about some of my views and adventures in a book called The Darkening Web, which uh, in its second edition is definitely worth you buying because it has extra darkness. So today I'm moderating a panel in a different role, namely as a director of something called the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. So basically this was a blue ribbon commission of 27 world famous experts on all different parts of cybersecurity from 16 different countries who volunteered their time to help influence the state-led discussions on war and peace in cyberspace, mostly taking place in the United Nations, but also other places. So our final report was launched in November 2019 at the Paris Peace Forum by the French foreign minister, the Dutch foreign minister, the head of the cybersecurity agency of Singapore, um, and an Oxford study once said we were a very influential private initiative. Um, two of my fellow panelists here on stage with me were also members of that commission. Uh, we're joined also by three panelists virtually, and I'll introduce everyone in due course. But what we all have in common is that we have, one way or another, recently started engaging in these international cybersecurity discussions that, as I said, are mostly state-led. And some of our panelists um, have been part of something called the UN Open-Ended Working Group, which is one of those discussions that first opened up to outside um, advice and consultation although to a limited extent and to limited effectiveness, as we will discuss. Now, that being said, the walls are coming down between the hallowed halls of arms control and cybersecurity and the technical community. The question is, how fast are they coming down? Because this is being diplomacy. This happens very, very, very slowly. So part of the point of this discussion is we're hoping maybe we can encourage the process a little bit. Uh, maybe take down a couple thank you, of, of those bricks, speed it up, and see what all of us here can do to contribute. So we're going to do uh, a round with the panelists before opening up to the wider discussion, hopefully including a bunch of you. And uh, first I want to introduce Lauren Zabiek, who is currently the director of the Cyber Project at Harvard University. So Lauren, can you help set the stage for us a little bit? Um, tell us where these international discussions are and what do they aim to achieve? Absolutely, Alex and the entire DEF CON crew there. Thank you so much for having me. This is truly an honor and I desperately wish I could be there with you. But um, anyway, as Alex said, my job here is to set the scene for you. So at one point or another, we have all heard that the cyber domain is the Wild West. There have been little in the way of codified norms and rules to really guide state behavior in cyberspace, despite the internet having been around for decades. We've all witnessed the rapid development of cyber conflict over the last de decade or so, despite the ample attention and work done in this space over the last several years. And thank you, Chris Painter, one of our, our esteemed panelists. Um, even with Russia's open-ended working group or Russian-led open-ended working group, uh, the report that was signed remarkably by all 193 nations at the UN this past spring, and which reaffirmed all 11 norms set forth for, by the previous group of governmental experts, we seem to be no closer to real rules in cyberspace, and yet, as we know, the threats continue to grow in scale, complexity, and sophistication. So how did we get here? First, I think it's important to A, revisit the concept of norms in the first place, and then B, understand the general lines of thinking by the major blocks that really serve to underscore you know, just how far apart we are, despite theoretically sharing a goal of stability and security in cyberspace. Then we'll come back to this, uh, the current state. I'd like to say that I'm Tarantinoing the shebang, but truthfully, I've never seen Pulp Fiction, which, as my husband says, is a problem. 
<laughs> okay, so where did the concept of norms and cyber space come about? Well, it goes back to the late 90s when Russia, seeing the internet and ICTs specifically as a threat to their sovereignty and security, wanted to introduce arms control agreements and rules at the UN. The West, specifically at the, the US, thought international law should really apply to conflict in cyberspace and wanted instead to promote the adoption of, of norms for responsible state behavior. The problem, though, is that, you know, we were thinking more about how international law covered cyber warfare, and I don't think we were really covering the other stuff and how that other stuff could get so dangerous. And then by that, I mean the so-called gray zone. And it's my opinion that part of, you know, these authoritarian state strategy has been to essentially exploit that, see, show, hey, you know, we need rules. This is what happens when we don't. But unfortunately, those rules, we think, would give legitimacy to the ideas that we in the West are against, namely state control over the internet by authoritarian states. So in 2017, the UN GGE collapses over some agreements, disagreements between states and Alex Grigsby famously declares this is the end of norms. Then the Russians come out with their proposal and expanding membership to all, uh, all the different countries in the UN. Needless to say, the US wasn't super thrilled with all of this. Um, at the same time, we're seeing things like WannaCry, Crash Override, NotPetya, the election meddling. Basically, shit's getting real. So the next year, US, uh, the United States elevates Cybercom to a combatant command and then you know comes out with the strategy of persistent engagement to fend forward, which all the other nations are like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, recalling um, the Thucydides trap. Essentially, um, Ben Buchanan forecasts in cyberspace the actions that one nation takes to secure themselves are going to be seen as threatening by others. And Russia most sur surely sees this as aggressive. So then recognizing relations between our two countries are at an all time low and quite honestly, people are worried. So in 2019, we at the Belfer Center added a, a cyber component to our track two dialogue with the Elba group. Out of that meeting came a, a paper exploring rules of the road in cyber with Russia that we just published back in June. In that, we state that bilateral agreements with Russia could be good for our long term security, but we're just so far apart in our interests and our perspectives on the internet, it, internet that it wouldn't be feasible or advisable to do this in the short term. One thing to keep in mind though, and this is something that I learned from writing this paper, is that Russia has never publicly acknowledged any offensive cyber capability or activities in cyberspace. So a main barrier to discussions is how to even start these discussions with a nation that won't even acknowledge that capability. And then, how do we reconcile completely different viewpoints on the internet that speak to the different values as nations? So the questions are, are norms so last decade or are they back now? Is bilateralism the way ahead? Clearly there are lots more questions than answers right now. And that is essentially where we are. Thanks. Uh, okay, thanks Lauren. Um, I'm gonna ask Chris Painter to maybe take this a little bit forward and maybe also circle back, explain a little bit what norms are, but also what uh, non-state actors are really doing in the space and how that came about. We heard from Lauren, for instance, how Harvard has started a so-called track two process. That's basically a formally informal process um, between the US and Russia. There are quite a few other uh, such processes, but let me just quickly introduce Chris, who currently is the president of the Global Forum of Cyber on, on Cyber Expertise, <laughs> um, before being elevated to that position um, and to the member of the Global Commission. Uh, he was a lowly uh, first cyber diplomat of the United States um, after a long career in the Department of Justice in the White House. Um, so again, Chris, I think those discussions are still very state-led, but they are opening up a little yeah. bit as we hear, right? So, so just to circle back a little on, on uh, what Lauren said and build on it, you know, this idea of norms, I mean, the, the dynamic here was that um, Russia and to some extent China, and China kind of played more in the game later on, it was really Russia leading this in the beginning, uh, wanted a binding treaty, wanted, worried about content on the internet, they, they viewed um, information warfare, but they, they viewed information as the biggest threat to them. Not the kind of technical threats that we talk about, but things that would undermine their power structure or dissent or issues like that. And so, you know, the U.S. response, as Lawrence said, coming up with these ideas of norms, 
first of all, the idea of international law applies means this is not a free fire zone. Not anything goes. So international law applies, but international law is at this very high level. Um, you know, it's, it's when we have cyber warfare. And despite all you read in the press constantly, we're at cyber war. We're not at cyber war. Yes, the distinction is blurring, but we're not at cyber war. And the, what we see every day are below those thresholds. They're the thefts of intellectual property that we've seen. They are the, um, they're the, not petty, they're the other kinds of uh, malicious state activity um, that we see all the time. And they have a large effect. Uh, we also see criminal groups like the recent ransomware groups. So what norms are are expectations of behavior. They're not hard law. They are a way to say, this is what we expect. This is what you expect a state to do. And they really break down into two categories in the way I look at it, or the way many people look at it, just not me. Uh, norms of restraint. So you know what the US did is counter the Russian idea of having a binding treaty that would try to cover cyber weapons, whatever the hell they are, with uh, taking targets off the table. Norms of restraint, don't go after X. So don't go after critical infrastructure. Uh, because during peacetime, during wartime, you can, just like you can go after the train lines you know, in, a, in a shooting war, but you then have to obey certain rules of distinction and proportionality, et cetera. So don't go after critical infrastructure. Don't go after the certs or the C certs. It's like going after the hospitals or ambulances on the internet. So those are kind of norms of restraint, taking targets off the table. There's also norms of cooperation. Work with us on something. You know, if we have a common threat, let's work together. Let's build, uh, build better confidence by doing that. So those are the two kinds of norms, and they agreed to 11 of these norms, which are pretty comprehensive back in 2015 before everything fall, fell apart. Now, as Lauren also said, this has been the province of states alone. This is in something called the First Committee of the UN, which was the denizens of arms control people. And when people talk like nuclear and other issues, they don't generally involve other stakeholders. States, you know, these, and the UN is not built for other stakeholders. It is built for states, um, which is great in some ways, but kind of sucks in other ways. Because if you think about the, the panoply of issues in cyberspace, including the war and peace issues, and, and how norms are enforced and how they work. You need people who understand how the frickin' internet works as part of that discussion. And that's not, or that's not normally diplomats. It's not normally government people uh, who go to these meetings. Now, it's increasingly changed. There, you know, I was the first cyber diplomat in the US. There are now 40 like that around the world. Great. But you need some understanding of how these things work. You need involvement of the technical community, of academia, of, uh, of uh, civil society, because there are issues like human rights involved. And you need the involvement of, um, of uh, of industry, too. So those are important components, but the UN's not really built for it. There's been a glimmer of hope and change um, in, in that the UN in this last thing, when they had this big open-ended working group, which was all 193 countries, they held an informal meeting where other stakeholders came together, and I was there, and I was there was others, and, and some of other panels were there, too, and they were able to give uh, statements, and they were able to contribute to the discussion. So that's great. By UN terms, that's amazing, right? But it still is not a lot. You know, it still is a stepping stone. You're not really involved in negotiations. Uh, you're not even involved in a lot of discussions often. Now, they were able to send in comments. You could send in comments on various things, and that's great. But it wasn't clear that was really having an effect on the actual negotiations. Some countries were really good, like Australia, for instance, in getting formally comments from their, their stakeholders, and, and Canada as well, and channeling that into their submissions in the UN and their positions. But we're a far cry from other stakeholders being clearly involved in these issues. And for the reasons I stated, I think that's an essential thing. Not that the other stakeholders will drive these discussions. At the end of the day, states are going to decide what they're, what they're going to do or not going to do. You know, they're going to be the ones who decide that. But it needs to be informed by other folks. And that's an opportunity for people in this room, too, and we'll get into that. Thanks, Chris. So one of the people, to quote Chris, who knows how the freaking internet works is Bill Woodcock. Uh, who leads Packet Clearinghouse and Quad9 and uh, also is a member of the Global Commission. So one of the questions to ask straight off, not only why did you join, presumably you, you, you saw the common good in it, but what were the challenges for you going in and also what did you learn? Um, you're about as technical as it gets. It was a very different community that you were engaging with. What were your key takeaways? So, you know, the, the private sector's engagement in this conflict uh, started in 1992 when the privatization of the internet began, and we're 29 years into that process now. Um, it's, uh, you know, in prior to that, prior to the National Information Infrastructure Plan, uh, 
was sort of the communist era of the internet. Uh, everything was paid for by the US Defense Department. They would decide how much you needed, how much you got. All the bills went to them. Uh, you couldn't make more. Uh, if you needed more and they didn't think that you deserved it, you were out of luck. Uh, you couldn't transact business around it. You couldn't buy and sell it because it wasn't your property, it was their property. Uh, so this was Al Gore's big contribution to the internet. The NII made it legal to make more internet bandwidth and buy and sell it and uh, sort of turned over the reins to the private sector globally. Uh, prior to that point also there wasn't really internet in Russia or China. Uh, you know, little tiny, tiny token bits, uh, but not enough that as governments, they took it very seriously. So in the early 90s, between 92 and 96 or so, is when you see the emergence of conflict between particularly the US and Russia uh, on the internet. And the problem here is that this is also the period when the internet is becoming private sector. Everything, essentially everything new that's been built since 1992 has been built by the private sector at private sector expense, private sector maintenance, private sector investment. Um, this differs from normal national conflict because uh, there is no, no man's land, no high seas. There's nowhere where governments can conflict with each other uh, that is not private property, somebody else's private property. And so this problem has been getting worse and worse ever since then. Uh, and the private sector has more and more to lose as we become more invested in the internet, as it becomes more central to what we have to do every day. So this is not a new conflict. It's been going on basically my whole career. Uh, and, you know, it, it's really difficult to get governments to pay attention when they don't want to. And governments, as Alex and Chris both said, are very used to getting together behind closed doors in the UN, just talking to each other and assuming that each government is the fully authorized representative of all of its citizens and their interests. When in fact, Collectively, governments have a lot in common with each other, and the private sector has a lot in common with each other. And the private sector now is pretty transnational, in fact. The internet particularly is really transnational. Uh, you know, m most people on the internet aren't thinking, well, I'm gonna go and deal with other Americans on the internet. I'm gonna buy stuff from American companies on the internet, and there's gonna be some border there at the edge of America and you know, I'll know if I cross that border. That's not how it works, right? We all know that we're buying and selling things with people all over the world, companies that are incorporated, who knows where, doing business in lots of different countries. And so this divide between private sector interests and governmental interests has become very stark. And governments, particularly the folks who are doing military stuff, have a lot in common with each other and get together behind closed doors to try and figure out how they can create norms which normalize the status quo, where the status quo is really problematic for the private sector. The status quo of governments just sort of running around breaking shit and leaving the private sector to clean up and then awarding themselves ribbons, eh, this doesn't really help us. So that's that's why I continue to try and engage with them and continue to try and push the norms towards uh, like don't okay. break our stuff if you're not prepared to pay for it. Um, oh. All right, T tired of cleaning up somebody else's mess. All right, got that message. Going back online, um, Shital Kumar was one of the most active members from the non-state community in this open-ended uh, working group that we referenced. So she represents uh, an NGO called Global Partners Digital, which is dedicated to promoting a digital environment underpinned by human rights. 
So, uh, Shital, please tell us, how do you think that non-state involvement in this process worked and where did it not work? Oh, thank you, Alex. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. I wish I could be with you in, in LA instead of coming to you from rainy land and all around parts of the world need a lot of rain, so I'm not going to complain about that. But, yeah, you asked me to speak about how the OEWG was set up and how that worked, uh, including from a non-state stakeholder perspective. And I think what's, what's interesting as well to comment on is that, as, as Laura mentioned, at the time when, when the OEWG was set up in 2018 through a resolution, it wasn't very popular. Um, for, for the reasons that were mentioned, and there's this political disagreements and, and lack of uh, common um, values and, and an understanding of how the internet should work and, and for whom. But over time, it became a space where I think a number of, of states who hadn't originally supported it realized it was useful for opening up the discussion and really for raising awareness about what had been agreed in a more closed format, the GGE format, and uh, that the responsible state behavior frameworks and the norms, confidence building measures and other things that have been agreed with a wider uh, community. And it was also an opportunity for NGOs or for non-state stakeholders to get involved. Um, and as we've heard from, from Bill and others, that's, that's really key because ultimately we're talking about a, a technology that, that is managed by non-state stakeholders. So like the thought, the, the fact that we hadn't been engaged at all in the discussion so thus far had been um, really, uh, I think it, that had been lacking. So there was an opportunity to engage stakeholders. And um, that happened, I think as Chris mentioned, through an informal intercessional in December, 2019. But the substantive sessions where the discussions happened between states were closed, unfortunately, in the end to ECOSOC accredited NGOs. So that was really unfortunate for those who are not ECOSOC accredited. And there, that's a lot of uh, stakeholders who are relevant and who, who are stakeholders in these discussions. The reason for that is the the disagreements um, around and, uh, the values, as as Lauren mentioned, um, around who should be involved in these discussions and and who are the relevant stakeholders. And unfortunately, although it could have been more open, it ended up being. I think uh, my understanding is like unprecedented in the sense that it was blocked to. Uh, NGO was that applied to engage, but couldn't in the end because of um, uh, member states blocking that uh, engagement. There was that opportunity, as um, mentioned, through that informal intercessional, but really, you know, unfortunately, the UN is a space that is defined by the strictures, and, and it's not the, the only time that it's been difficult to gain access to discussions. So there are, apart from the formal opportunities to engage, also the informal. So NGOs, uh, whether it's um, a civil society, academia, or um, those uh, who, uh, you know, the, the techies, um, can utilize different ways to, to share um, perspectives, including um, what we might call more informal opportunities. So spaces outside the UN, um, and bilateral or, or like building relationships with, with the key stakeholders there, with, with diplomats. And one thing that we did is proactively create a space to input into the OEWG's report with member states who are supportive of NGO engagement. And it was an initiative called Let's Talk Cyber, which we held through virtual platforms last year. We, we held a series of discussions to directly input, well, indirectly, um, input into all of the OEW mandate uh, discussions. Um, and we, we built a report out of that and submitted that to the OEWG. So I think, you know, as we look forward to the new OEWG, which is going to be having its first meeting in a few months' time, where the modalities are still being discussed, we need to keep pushing for more open, formal modalities and opportunities for engagement because as uh, you know, my fellow panelists have just mentioned, it's so important for us to do that, but we can also utilize informal opportunities um, and we need to keep doing that because these discussions are really key. Right, right. 
Well, lastly, but certainly not least, so uh, Martin van Hornbeek. So Martin is a former chair of FIRST. That's the form of incident responders and security teams, which is probably the closest thing that we have to a globally representative body of technical cyber defenders. So Martin, um, why were you guys involved in this? I mean, and you're involved in a lot of things. And do you think that the, and some of the things that you're involved in are pretty informal? Um, so you were involved in the formal process as well. So how did that play out for you, the formal component versus the informal component? Yeah. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here today, uh, Alexander. Um, when I first got involved into this, it really dates back quite a few years. Um, first is the global community of incident response teams or blue teams, if you will. Um, and we have about 590 teams across 98 countries. So we are truly global. And historically, we have been an organization of engineers, people who felt they could solve internet issues through code, through working together and building technological solutions. And we did that by making sure that incident responders, when they had an incident, they could find other incident responders within our community to respond effectively and making sure that they had the right standards and technology to work together and exchange information. Now, Within the incident response community, what makes it really unique is that it has this very deep mesh of trust. I remember very well when I lived in Belgium in uh, the mid-2000s and I was working on a set of targeted attacks investigating them. I could very easily send an email to another incident responder in the United States or anywhere in the world and ask them for some help and we would start collaborating and that trust would really develop. Now, in the last 15 years or so, there's been a significant increase in governments, policymakers taking a really strong interest in cybersecurity. And I think that just makes sense. There have been a ton of incidents from the big internet worms in the early 2000s over Stuxnet, Diginot, or Avalanche, SolarWinds that have just had a lot of impact both on national security in some cases or the economy in other cases. And as a result, they have started looking at us and sort of describing or trying to understand what it is that this technical community does. And I think in many ways they kind of categorize incident responders as being sort of the fire brigade of the internet. The people that kind of jump up when there is an incident and deal with the technical um, outcomes. Now, first over the years added as a goal to educate these policymakers on what it is that incident responders actually do to avoid being prescribed or bucketed in a particular category and uh, that would make it difficult for us to actually do our work and a few years ago i had a good conversation with a diplomat from a particular country who shared with me that they were working on an idea to have essentially every cybersecurity incident in the country be reported to one national entity and that entity would be responsible for international collaboration. And when I kind of asked them why they were doing that, uh, one of the things that came out of that was um, a document that the UNGGE, another UN process, in 2015 published. And that document actually literally said that states needed to take some ownership um, to not allow their territory to be used for internationally wrongful acts using technology. And that can be actually a scary sentence. Like by itself, if you read it as a technologist, you might not really worry about that. But when someone who isn't a technologist reads that, they might suddenly read that they need to take responsibility for everything that happens in their country. And as I said, incident response, when a big incident happens, we have to be able to respond to it in minutes and hours, not in days or weeks. So we can't really push it to a national entity to take over that coordination. And so as a result, uh, we felt it was really, really important to provide some of that technical insight, some of that perspective in the OEWG discussions. And that's why we really, really got involved. And I think we didn't get a ton of the language that we directly proposed necessarily into these documents, but with any political diplomatic process, the process is as important as the outcomes. And so what we did see was that through our own engagement and working really closely with people like Shetal, who really enabled uh, civil society to engage with particular stakeholders, we were able to help shift that language, shift that thinking. And that's an ongoing process that I feel is going to take many, many years and is going to require a lot more of us to actually get engaged and, uh, and educate. And, and I should just add, there's a, there's a sort of funny incident that Martin is aware of that um, 
years ago during one of the first annual conferences in Malaysia, I was giving the keynote speech and I talked about this idea of norms, including the one protecting certs. Uh, and the other disconnect here is that the people who do these norms, including back in 2015, didn't really have much connection with the people even they were trying to protect, in this case, the, the C-certs. Uh, and several people in the audience raised their hands after I gave my speech and said, hey, wouldn't it be great if the UN did this? And I said, well, they did do it like two years ago. Um, and, the, and not having any dialogue between those communities makes so little sense. Just on that point, and just uh, Martin, also for you to follow up and uh, really everyone to comment, I thought it was really important to highlight that you were getting involved also more or less out of defensive purposes because you were reading basically bullshit and you needed to comment and call it out. And it just reminds me that in some of the conversations I've been in, in uh, like in the OSCE and other intergovernmental entities, the first thing they want to establish is, for instance, a hotline. And everyone wants a hotline. It's the favorite thing that everyone has. And I asked at one point, have any of you heard of INOC DBA? Which gentleman next to me has had a definitive role in setting up. And that is already kind of a hotline for, for cyber defenders. And of course they haven't. So they ended up building up their own hotline. So my question to really the, all the panelists is, uh, what happens when these things really are, get introduced on top of each other? Do they conflict? I mean, it's, a conf it's really a question also for, for Bill. Does it just get ignored or is it really a value added? And if it isn't a value added, if it's a conflict, do you have to do what Martin does and get directly involved with your policymaker and say, please back off, you're about to break the internet again? I think, you know, Martin really has it right that you know, when government looks at this and, you know, behind closed doors, several governments have gotten together and said, well, you know, there's a problem here. Clearly, we're the ones who should solve it because we're the only ones talking to each other. Uh, you know, we'll solve it by making ourselves individually responsible for what happens inside our countries, which we already are. And to be responsible, that means we have to take it over. Um, you know, no, you don't want your fire department run by a UN bureaucracy. You'd like your fire department to arrive before the fire has already burned down the neighborhood, not like next year sometime. Uh, and, you know, my take is that I'd rather governments weren't exclusively the domain of pyromaniacs who like burning shit down. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this stuff seems kind of self-evident to us, but we're not the ones behind the closed doors in this echo chamber. Um, it, it's really hard to know how to deal with that other than this sort of continued campaign of engagement and education. Um, many governments are like the US government where the average age is 24 and they've just graduated from you know, a poli-sci program somewhere and done an internship and now they're the experts making laws. It, and, you know, they haven't actually been out there doing anything and they haven't actually had responsibility for anything yet with any consequences to it. And so it's really difficult, particularly, I mean, the military, big militaries are, are the worst there because they just, you know, award themselves medals for offensive actions. They're sitting there throwing rocks with no concept of whose responsibility it is to repair the glass houses and, you know, no idea of defense, right? There is zero blue team <laughs> out there, uh, you know, in military. So you get these, these weird yeah, splits, like in the U.S., between DHS with defensive responsibility and, and Cyber Command with offensive. And Cyber Command, I mean, I can't even guess what the difference in budget between Cyber Command and CISA is. But, you know, safe to say that it should be the other way around if we don't want to be constantly having things broken. Okay, well, speaking about burning things down and throwing stones and glass houses and things like that, um, government sometimes is concerned with letting people like Bill into their hallowed halls. So what are they particularly concerned about, Chris? And what are the rules, <laughs> no, look, I, I think what are the rules that other people need to learn? Governments certainly don't have a monopoly. And Laura and I, I think you were, you were. Yeah, you governments certainly don't have a monopoly thing. of burning things down. And certainly, and, you know, I think it's, it's sort of myopic to say it's like the US and Russia. Almost every country that has the ability to build, uh, you know, cyber offensive tools is, and that's a lot of countries. So these, this idea of norms, this idea of expectations, the idea of taking things off the, tar uh, off the table is really important because that helps build stability in the long run. So, so I don't think there's you know, a danger to have that engagement. You want that engagement. 
to help inform these things. And, and some of the norms even that we were just talking about, like the one about you're responsible for ha things happening in your territory, that could be used in a very good way. So let's take the ransomware example that's happened now. Even if these criminal groups are operating without the imprimatur of the Kremlin, you know, I can argue that both ways, but let's say they're not, then that's what the Biden administration has said. That norm, I think, would apply in saying that Russian, the Russian government still has a responsibility to do something. Now, it doesn't mean take over the internet. It means that they have a responsibility to go after that group, and I think that that's really important. Um, so, so, you know, it's part, the norms are important. How they're interpreted and actually used, I think, is really important. Uh, and that's where other stakeholders, I think, can really provide that context. Uh, Lauren, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, just, you know, on the you know, question of, of, you know, the practitioners being in the hallowed halls of government, um, I think more and more, at least, we are understanding the utility of that, right? So the whole conversation around, you know, public-private partnerships, um, bringing experts in. I mean, look at our our leadership now, um, you know, at the, the highest levels of government, these are people who really understand these particular issues. So I am hopeful, at least, that the conversation is starting to evolve and, you know, we're getting better at that. Uh, Sheetal, what do you think? In particular, your group focuses all on human rights concerns and some of the security topics are pretty dominant. And there's always been the point out there that because of security, we might infringe on other interesting aspects of daily life, like, for instance, our right to privacy. How does that all play out for you, and how do you see your role in, in uh, getting to governments to, to rein in their behavior? Yeah, well, I mean, these the, the norms and, and the discussions at the UN are about how states behave, and states have obligations um, uh, under international law, which, which includes international human rights law. So, Ultimately, uh, the the way they behave, what they invest in, what they do, what they don't do, has an impact on on human rights. So it is a question of uh, being there, reminding them of that, uh, um, and the links, and also how what the commitments they, they that they've made, for example, the norms exactly. linked to human rights. Uh, exactly. But it's also, I I think, um, something that like. It, as someone else said, like it's something that is it's a process. It's kind of continuing. It's a way that we we are constantly defining and understanding the norms and the commitments, and and the, that's why it's so important for a wider community to be involved in shaping uh, that understanding, because it is an evolving discussion, and that's how we see. I think it's really important for everyone who's a stakeholder, which is <laughs> everyone really, because we're also dependent on the on on the internet, and we're also impacted by how states behave in cyberspace, and so that's why it's really important we are, we're involved in these discussions that can bring to the table what's actually happening in the real world, outside the hallowed walls, um, how it's impacting people and societies, and uh, so that the discussions that are happening there are shaped by reality, what's, what's really going on. So just a final question to the panelists, and then it would be great to hear questions um, from everyone here. Um, so Chris and I had an interesting question at a roundtable we did this morning, which was basically the point of this panel, which was, this really scares me. How can I get involved? I'm reading really scary stuff in the paper every day, bad laws, bad bills, bad treaties. Um, what can I do? So this is the question to everyone on, on the panel. What's the best way for people who are not part of uh, uh, prestigious universities or established NGOs to really get involved in these discussions and participate? Who wants to go first? Maybe I'll start and just say, look, there's, you know, there's strength in numbers, too. Uh, lots of people here are members of different professional organizations. Uh, they're members of universities, as Alex said. That there, are lots, there, you know, there are lots of civil society uh, organizations that you can join and be involved in. One thing that, even though there were some states that blocked this larger multi-stakeholder involvement, not surprisingly, like China and Russia, don't really you know, all the stakeholders in China and Russia are kind of owned by China and Russia, so it's a little different dynamic. Um, but they were able to agree, all 25 countries were able to agree that where all stakeholders have a role is in implementing the norms, whereas really where the payday is, right? So how, how you interpret those norms, how you carry them forward, how you actually implement them is a critical part. And that's where I think there's not even opposition to other people getting involved. 
Um, Alex mentioned that one of the things I do now is run this uh, global forum on cyber expertise. It's got 60 countries. It's got about, dozen, about two dozen industry participants. It's got a lot of civil society, uh, including some of the people on the screen. Uh, and so uh, it's been a good forum to do exactly this, to use capacity building to train diplomats, talk about norms, talk about building C-certs, talking about cybercrime issues. There are lots of opportunities out there. They're not as accessible as they should be, I think, Alex. I think the problem is that especially folks in this room just don't know what those opportunities are, and we need to do a better job of trying to make those more available to them. Yeah, thanks. Well, I think, I Alex, know. one thing that, that I would add is, um, from my perspective, it's still too easy to discard another um, stakeholder group's perspective. It's still too easy for engineers to sit together and say, we don't want these policy people involved, let us do our thing. It's still too easy for uh, government representatives to think they can actually solve it all. And I think the first thing we all need to do is really think about like what are our roles and responsibilities and understand that the internet is actually something that involves all of these and really describe like what is our piece in this and what is the thing that others don't understand about what we're doing and how do we get that across. And I think if we can solve that problem and we can really figure out how to engage with each other across those boundaries by learning each other's language and starting to use it a little bit more. And um, I think that is going to be a really, really big impacting thing for all of us to, to get closer together. And then I think it's just the key of finding organizations, um, such as the organization that, that Chris is responsible for, first, um, many other types of organizations that engage, um, and, and just asking for opportunities to connect because those opportunities do exist. But to Chris's point, they're not always equally accessible, but if you reach out, you can find a way in. I think just reacting to what Martin just said, I think, you know, I would like to credit all participants with uh, good faith participation in the conversation, but I think it's difficult for internet folks who view the internet as underpinning commerce globally to uh, credit good faith on the part of diplomats when diplomats are looking at all of the things in front of them as being fungible and are happy to throw the internet under the bus in exchange for a pipeline right of way, for instance. Um, it Only a majorly gross oversimplification. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, a it's an example. It's a gross simplification, but it's what diplomats do. It's their job to take a whole lot of different unrelated interests and trade them off against each other. And you know, the internet is an interest, and we don't really like being traded off against some random unrelated thing. Uh, and that's, that's something that's really hard to get past, particularly when we are used to multi-stakeholder governance and we're used to, in fact, being a bunch of the different stakeholder groups in a multi-stakeholder governance discussion, and government is used to top-down, you know, a few governments get together and make a decision and tell everybody how it's going to be. So that, that's a really tough divide to bridge in how to have a conversation, uh, which is not to say that <laughs> we have any alternative but to try and bridge it. Um, uh. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I mean, we covered quite a lot of ground here. Uh, can I have a general show of hands? Uh, one gentleman here. Two. Okay. Please, sir. Given that we have a bail bondsman structure which allows us to go overseas and grab people who have committed uh, particular crimes. I'm not exactly certain about the legal details. What would it take to create a similar structure so that if I know that Charlie, the cyber terrorist, is uh, stealing stuff from me, where I could just go and send a bail bonds and then go get it? Okay, just to repeat the question. Um, uh, what you literally said is, is if it is possible to apply a national and international bail bondsman concept. I don't know about international bail bondsman, exist, yeah. but uh, a bail bondsman concept overall to an international international domain. So I guess what you're also asking is about the ability to hack back on behalf of governments or to pursue uh, or to pursue cyber criminals abroad. Is that right? Yeah. 
Uh, Got yeah, it. Thank well, you. and that's exactly the issue. Look, uh, you know, there's no real. And in fact, even in bail bondsmen, let's take it out of cyber, for instance. A bail bondsman goes to France and tries to kidnap uh, a criminal and bring him back to the U.S. They're going to get prosecuted in France. That's you know, that doesn't work in that scale. What happens in cyber crime and cyber and these other instances? If it's not state-sponsored, let's say it's these criminal groups, we just can't like land marshals in the territory and go after them. We have to get the cooperation of the other government, and there are treaties, there are MLAT, mutual legal assistance, there are extradition treaties. The problem is there are countries that are safe havens. We're seeing this with Russia and ransomware now. So how do you deal with them? And that becomes more of a geopolitical issue. You have to put pressure on the leadership of that country to play ball. Uh, that's hard with Russia, uh, for instance, but that's what's being attempted right now. And then if you can't, you have to think about how you can disrupt these criminal groups, or in addition to that, how you can disrupt these criminal groups even if you can't get a hold of them. And, and that's just the, the reality. And governments love to play coy about whether they are doing something or whether it is, you know, unsanctioned private parties within their country that are doing something or whether, haha, it wasn't me, it was you, you know, stop, uh, stop beating yourself on the head, right? Uh, it was a botnet in your own country. And uh, yeah, let's not discuss where the CNC for the botnet is coming from. So it, it's, it's really complicated to do this when governments are not, um, governments are not declaring war here. Right, Chris. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Got it, thanks. It's not terrorists, it's, it's large well, governments. Uh, uh, there's also, that also gets on the topic of which some governments get really excited about, which is um, hackback as a concept. And uh, in our um, commission that we, we have eight norms that we put forward, one of the norms are don't do hackback in the sense of not that you should protect your, your own networks, but you shouldn't go off and try to steal back your stuff or destroy the you know, the mothership or the CNC server where that stuff is on precisely because you never really know who started that fight. And governments are worried about inadvertent escalation happening when there's two parties fighting and it can't be really clear who, who started this. Um, let me just go to the gentleman over here. Do we have any other questions? So, okay, that's going to be the last one. Thanks. Oh, that's a really interesting question. So the question was, do the digital cyber sovereignty infrastructure structures that some countries like Russia and China have, will it spread to, foreign, to other countries? So basically their emphasis on protecting their own quote unquote cyberspace, having a clean information domain and policing their own information, the information published in that domain. Right. Okay. So you're talking about BricsNet and stuff like, like, like the bricks going off and creating their own internet and stuff like that. Okay. So, so an interesting question to ask is why have governments not always regarded the cyber domain as something that they have defensive responsibility for? So China and Russia both look at the cyber domain and say, well, we have to be able to exercise our defensive responsibility here. What do we need to be able to do to make that happen? What does defensive cyber look like at a national scale? And that drives their actions. And we look at that and say, wow, you know, that seems pretty totalitarian. But, you know, it, there's at least a, a clear logical path there. And, you know, we don't have any of that. Right. So, so I, I sort of, I sort of, yeah, I agree with that to a point. But what underlies their trying to control the internet is about political stability more than it is about cyber stability. So they are worried about dissenting speech. They're worried, you know, the Great Firewall of China is built for this. And the worry I have, and I think you're right. I think the, the one of the worries I have is that a lot of the developing world wants the you know, prosperous, uh, the prosper, you know, wants to prosper, and the economic growth and other things that a strong internet can have is great. But at the same time. They like stability, and so China and Russia are working very hard in those countries to get, and they're building their infrastructure and others to try to sway them in that view. All right, thanks. We're um, over time already, and we haven't completely taken down the walls between InfoSec professionals and cyber diplomacy. Maybe we've loosened the bricks a little bit. So um, please join me in thanking the panelists. Uh,
Ball. 